Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Logical Magic Examining Esoterica. Hey, guys, today we're doing an episode on the idea of being emotionally orphaned, which happens more frequently than people believe. It's not quite the same thing as abandonment issues, by the way. Um, it really, it's, and the role of spirituality in healing that, which is a very important part. Um, that when you are emotionally abandoned as a child, which is the same thing as being emotionally orphaned, that it can result in long-term dysfunction that then turks, it takes a turn into emotional disorders, sometimes stress disorders, sometimes emotional regulation disorders. I'm going to read you some of the symptoms before we get started with the uh, spirituality concept behind this as to what this might entail. It has social withdrawal and uh, isolation, unresolved childhood guilt, fear, feelings of insecurity and inferiority, sleep and eating disorders. Uh, we also have depression and or anxiety. Remember and or meaning that you may have it both. Grief, anger and rage, uncontrollable anger, unresolved internal childhood conflict, feelings of rejection, issues with intimacy and abandonment, inability to trust and build authentic relationships, difficulty expressing feelings, difficulty communicating needs, emotionally detached or disconnected, numb or desensitized to feelings, and having no voice, not being able to speak, which is actually something that um, comes in with a lot of trauma disorders. Uh, survivors. Um, I shared a long time ago that like when I was 13 years old, I didn't speak for a year. Like even in the time period that I was in, they were freaked out by how little I could communicate. And to this day, when triggered, I can stutter and lose the ability to speak. And that happens when you just begin to shut down tremendously. So what is the role? What is the worth of acknowledging the ways in which we've been harmed? It is that we can't heal something that we won't look at. Um, it is lovely in spirituality that these ideas of compassion and forgiveness are achieved. But if you have forgiven something without understanding what it actually did to you, you didn't actually forgive it. You didn't actually forgive it because you still carry a scar, a wound, or a trauma, or a life-defining energy that was caused by a set of circumstances. And one of the things that we need to do in the spirituality community is destigmatize the idea of recognizing having been victimized by abuse or assault. That is not the same thing as a victim mentality, and we have begun to treat it as being synonymous with a victim mentality. There is worth in the recognition of this happened, it did this to me, uh, it's what caused this particular issue in my life or this particular dysfunction. Releasing it then leads to the ability to forgive it. Understanding it, and when we're talking about disorder, one of the easiest cures for it is understanding because then you can put it into order. And what I find with my clients over and over again is that I will explain something to them and why they did it, and it puts a, a puzzle piece into place for them that they haven't done before, that they didn't realize that some of the things they might be disliking about themselves are results of trauma or symptoms of trauma versus character flaws or having a crappy personality or just kind of struggling with the internal world, that their trauma actually formed a lot of darkness within them and a lot of dysfunction. And when we learn about these things, when we look about them, we look at them, we can understand our dysfunction, which can lead to disorder. And when we understand the dysfunction that led to disorder, which does involve having to acknowledge it, then you're able to, through understanding and the application of different forms of theory and reaching for practices that will help connect you, you are able to resolve it, release it, and move forward. When we talk about releasing past versions of ourselves, what we really need to do is understand a past version of ourselves. The past is an unreliable narrator in our life because we can remember certain things that we may not be remembering them accurately, but we will, we will actually remember the emotionally important context. Until we are ready to face it, though, we may be in denial. Reaching for a spiritual practice is one of the things that can help you find solace, compassion, and comfort when confronting those difficult emotional situations within. Because when you look at something, when you begin digging around in it, you may have an emotional release around it. In fact, you're almost guaranteed to. It is uh, stirring up old energies. And in order to release it, it does have to be examined and it does have to be, in, I guess, you know, brought forth, almost purged. And that is the role of the understanding and not rushing to forgiveness, but waiting until you can achieve it 
naturally and authentically. Because karma will continue to repeat in a lesson learning cycle if we don't authentically do our work. And that can involve periods of recognizing like, oh my God, my parents or my upbringing was so dysfunctional that it caused me to be a form of orphan. And I've long known that. I've long known that about myself, um, that I, the template that I match the most closely is that of someone who uh, was completely abandoned and ended up in an orphanage with no emotional uh, tries to anyone. Until my son was born, I really wasn't emotionally tied to anybody because my caretaker were incredibly sick. And like I we've if you've been here before, I've gone into all the personality disorders, all the things that might have caused that, the tremendous trauma that my father went through in the Korean War because he was an older dad. Um, that my mother uh, was actually formed in an incredibly unhealthy household. And that her mother engaged in uh, fantasy and wishful thinking. She built narratives around stories to make herself feel more important. She was one of like 13 children or something. I genuinely don't know a lot about her family structure, other than it was a giant, giant family, which a lot of people in very large families end up with emotional abandonment issues or feeling as if they have been emotionally orphaned. So this is the very weighty topic, God knows I'm going to title this, that we are tackling today. And we're going to be examining the role of spirituality in alleviating those symptoms and providing you with refuge, with the ability to heal, with your own connection to your higher self, which was never damaged by a thing, which is actually what gives you your intuition. Your intuition went, which again, it's an emotionally void thing. It comes through as information. It does, if it, if you think you know something is coming and it makes you feel angry, it is not your intuition. If you think you know something and it makes you feel anxious, it is not your intuition. What am I always saying? If it ends in a question mark, it is not your intuition, it is your anxiety. If it ends with the idea that you are being afflicted, then it is not your intuition. It is a form of uh, victim energy that you have not resolved, that you have not confronted. We shame people for admitting what has happened to them because we think you're, you know, you're defining yourself as a victim and other people had it worse. True, but you only ever live your reality. Honest to goodness, like even whenever I talk about my childhood that it's like, oh yeah, therapists are like, you shouldn't be even close to normal. It's like, well, I wasn't for a while, but I'm fine now. Um, I will always be able to reach for examples of people I've personally met, people I've spoken to, people I've read about that had circumstances that I'm like, no, that, that seems worse to me. That seems a lot worse to me. People being locked out in blizzards and beaten by their drunken parents and like left to starve while their parents went off on drunken benders. That, that was not my parents. That was not my parents. My parents were pretentious. <laughs> they were pretentious people. Um, uh, they were very well educated, which is one of the things that actually helped me overcome a generational cycle because I was very well read from the time I was a child. Even though it turns out I have a mild form of dyslexia, which I didn't find out until two years ago. <laughs> when I was talking to my optometrist about how my astigmatism uh, caused things to reverse sometimes. And he looked at me and said, that's not an astigmatism. He said, that's a mild form of dyslexia. And I was like, that's interesting because I was a voracious reader. Apparently, I just have, you know, willpower for days or something. And before we get started, we have to do a little bit of housekeeping. If you need to find me for a tarot card reading or a life coaching session in which I help you figure out what's holding you back, the unhealed wounds present obstacles in your path. And they will be obstacles to success. They will be obstacles to meaningful relationships. Until you heal your stuff, you are dragging around baggage, energetic baggage, that particularly when you will not consider what really happened to you, there is no way to release something that you refuse to acknowledge. There just isn't. And so we all have to do this work. And some of us have to do more than others. And absolutely everybody incurred some form of trauma uh, to different degrees. We only ever live our own reality. But if you want to book me for a tarot card reading or a life coaching session to get started on that work, you would do so at atherisingmoon.com. It is the only way to book me. Um, you can also find me through my Patreon where I do weekly readings and monthly readings and special messages. And all of that stuff will be linked in the description box or the episode notes. The video version of this goes up on my um, YouTube channel, which is Chromecast at the Rising Moon. And then you can always find me here at Logical Magic Examining Esoterica. That's the housekeeping. Let's get it out of the way. Let's get back to the topic today because it's a super important one. A lot of people with abandonment issues then enact difficult relationship dysfunction. 
Um, they will go for emotionally unavailable people if, as a, for instance, when they were nine years old, their father left with the secretary and they thought they had a great, and they, but those type of people have a tendency to fantasize about their parents getting back together. If you're like me, you had a childhood where I was so relieved that my parents broke up. It absolutely astounded me and mystified me that people wanted their parents together. My parents were insanely violent together. I genuinely have no idea how much uh, damage was done to me um, through the fact that they both had explosive rage. Um, and they would direct it. Uh, you know, like, you know, I'm positive. Uh, I was even told about some things that happened to me when I was two and three years old that it's like, okay, so I was being pretty soundly beaten on a regular basis at that point if I made a mistake, which made me very frightened of ever trying new things as an adult. And I did overcome that. But emotional orphaning is ever, ever so slightly different from an abandonment issue. An abandonment issue comes from, I had this stable enough life because nobody really gets a perfect life. And then something came along and caused me to feel abandoned. It can be illness so that the, the parent is still present or the caretaker is still present. It can be divorce. It can be death. Certain things can cause abandonment issues. But in order to feel abandoned, you have to have felt included and secure to begin with. And a lot of the people I talk to are actually emotional orphans, meaning that they came into a family with so much emotional dysfunction and so much disorder that nobody was there to help them with their emotional needs because they were sick people. And addiction will cause it because narcissism and addiction are like this because people are very focused on the thing that they're addicted to. And so they will sacrifice every personal relationship around them. It will make them that focus and all children need care and attention. Part of the reason that this has become such a predominant thing in the modern day age is that we are only recently in history outside of constant survival mode for the you know, highest percentage of the population. It really is only within the last century or so that uh, we have had adequate access to uh, basic needs like shelter and uh, food, even if you weren't living in the farmland. Uh, part of the thing with Thanksgiving, which we are rolling up on now, is that people would be celebrating their harvests. And what I hear from people who grew up in extreme poverty is it was one of the only bountiful times in their lives. Other than that, they were really, really rather desperately poor. And so it was the only time that they felt bountiful bounty and abundance. When we have a life of deprivation, it causes a scarcity mindset, it causes a lack mindset, and it can cause us to continue to really focus on the lack in our life rather than the benefits. Even as things get better, we will have a really hard time believing that they are going to stay that way. Do we truly manifest our fears? Not exactly. Karmic lessons come to us to try and help us resolve our lesser attachments like fear, like anger, like grief, like all the things that I read at the top of this. Emotional abandonment occurs when you grow up with people who are mentally ill, people who are suffering from addiction, and this can be, uh, there's more than one thing can be true at once and more than one thing can be present here because we're describing multiple things in my family. There was uh, my main caretaker until I was 12 and she died rather suddenly after setting that house fire. It found, I was found out that my grandmother had all sorts of cancer um, and she basically uh, declined over the course of about six months and died. Um, and then after that, it was, uh, I lived with my very dysfunctional father who then dramatically died when I was 15 years old and very dramatically, he was coughing up blood and all kinds of things. And, you know, trigger warning, if that's enough to upset you, like the, the depth of that story would trigger you very, very badly indeed. Um, but I didn't realize what an odd teenager I was because he had been in the hospital for a week before that. And I lived all by myself. I fed the dog. I locked up the house. I like, I'm still astounded at just how insanely responsible I was. And I would walk to the hospital and back home. And it was about three miles each way. And I did it in the rain and all kinds of things. And I did not understand that that was not normal and that people were really taking notice of that. And so one of the things that I want to talk to you about with the idea of being emotionally abandoned and having emotional orphan syndrome, um, where nobody was there to meet your needs because you were raised by very, very sick people. And so you never formed a healthy connection because what it really takes in the life of child exposed to dysfunction is one healthy connection with another person. So a doting grandmother can do it, an uncle, an aunt, a cousin. I didn't have any of those things. Both of my parents were only children. I was raised basically as an only child because when my mother left my father, she took my brother. She initially took me, but my father would show up and harass me. And it was like, I think of 
like watching this happen to a seven year old. And I was like, oh my God, it was a different time. He would have ended up in jail today with the things that he was doing. And so my mother just basically threw me back to him because, you know, she thought, I don't know what she was thinking. She obviously rationalized the hell out of that. I was a seven year old kid. It was pathetic. Um, and she sent me back to a house that was, you know, had no refrigerator and didn't have a washer. And like, I lived with tons and tons of deprivation in my life. I didn't have any furniture either because she'd taken all out. Um, and she managed to rationalize that. But that is, so it compounded um, emotional orphaning with a very purposeful abandonment, which she would do to me on multiple, multiple occasions. But when my father died, she then insisted that I go and live with her because by that time I looked like her. And there is no bigger death knell for a narcissistic parent-child relationship where you are the empath and the parent is the narcissist than looking like your parent because they truly do not understand that other people are not there to serve them. Narcissists really believe that other people are primarily there to serve their needs. Empaths give and give and give and give and give and then have compounded issues with resentment and anger when other people do not reciprocate at that same unhealthy level. And so we have to strike that balance. And that is what doing this work helps you do, is you balance yourself out. You understand your darker side so you can forgive yourself because self-forgiveness is a very big and important part of this. One of the things that went into finding out about emotional orphan syndrome which uh, is a fairly new term, um, was that I kept getting the orphan card over and over again from one of the Colette Baron Reed decks. And I didn't look into it. I didn't look into it. And then one day I ran the research and I was like, oh my God, that's me. That's me. That's me. That's me. That's me. Over and over again, I get led to the things that will provide some more information. And these things come to us in stages as we are able to process and accept that information. Try not to rush your healing journey because you're very unlikely to ignore the depth of the pain and the dysfunction in your life. And again, through understanding comes the ability to take that dysfunctional energy that led to disorder if you understand it, you take it to functionality because there will be a method and a means in order for you to put your own energy house into order, which then you will have order within it. And that is the way that you take out disorders. That is why I have had an eating disorder that is resolved. I have had a general anxiety disorder that I do not take medication for. Can anxiety still get me sometimes? Yeah, but I know how to treat it. Um, this is why people can have all forms of different disorders that through understanding of self, they can respond exceptionally well to things like talk therapy, talking things through. Uh, because the, of the prevalence of Zoom and online communication, you are no longer limited to simply therapists within your area. And you can also find therapists across the nation who then specialize in your form of trauma as well. And it helps to go with someone who is specialized. And I really do. Now, this is where like I can be a little hypocritical because like, I really encourage people to go to therapists. I kind of don't, but it is because I get information from a main connection. I was so incredibly isolated that I connected to essentially a divine source as a younger person, even though I had to resolve a lot of anger. And it was completely normal to have been angry at the way I was treated. I would be angry on behalf of a complete stranger. If I saw my life story and I was watching a movie of it, I would eventually be outraged with what is wrong with those people treating a kid like that. Um, and it's not self-pity because it really is enough of a distance that I react to that part of myself like such a distant version of me that it's simply understanding of what went into making me. In order to understand yourself, you basically have to deconstruct yourself and be like, okay, what poured my foundation? Why I am? Why am I the way that I am? And emotional orphaning is all, far more common than we believe it to be. Now, is it at all generational? A little bit. It can be. The boomer generation, I'm not somebody who bags on boomers. I'm not. I'm Gen X. Like a lot of Gen X people, there was a lot of abandonment and being left to raise yourself. I just have it at like the, you know, 10th power to the nth degree type of thing. Um, but that came partially because in the boomer generation, they were a generation that uh, brought new beginnings. They were after the World War II. And, you know, in America, we're taught that we rode to the rescue. And it's a little bit more complicated than that. But it can cause people to be a little bit like, I'm super important. I'm here to rebuild this world. And it's part of the reason that there are different forms of dysfunction that follow different forms of generations. So why were the people, the silent generation and the very early boomers, the people most likely to be emotionally abandoning their children? I specifically do not know. 
I cannot claim, uh, I can't, I don't know enough about that one to speak intelligently on the subject, but it is a repeating pattern throughout history. And it is something that we have noticed is that, uh, like there is every generation has a different hallmark with it. And it's not about shame or judgment or blame. It's about understanding. And if we just kind of circle back to the idea of understanding whether or not you have abandonment issues or you have emotionally orphaned issues where nobody took care of you, you were parentified. I was parentified, but it wasn't towards younger siblings. I literally had to take care of my father. He was a completely non-functional human being. He really could not function at an adult level. And I don't specifically know why. He was insanely intelligent. He was a very, very, very bright man. I did not come from dumb folk, but they were very complicated and very, very sick and very, very, very self-involved and violent. And they wouldn't admit it um, afterwards. Like they would own it, but they would blame each other. So like I was always hearing the stories of this terrible thing happened, that terrible thing happened, you know, banging people's heads against driveways and type of things. But it was always the fault of the other person, according to like, even though the perpetrator of that violence was frequently the person telling the story. And we all do that. We cast ourselves as the main character in our own script because we're meant to. But some people get a little out of control with it. And that is where personality disorders often come in, where you can't see beyond your own pain. When you begin to examine your life for what it contains, you can see beyond your own pain and understand this is an ingredient list that is going to result in this. If I have problems with depression or anxiety, if I have problems with like, because what I see in cards a lot is people, particularly women, because they are encouraged to repress their emotions a lot when it comes to anger, um, is that people have uncontrollable bouts of volcanic rage that is not necessarily destructive, but it feels awful. And they think it's just a part of them. It's like, no, it's actually, that's part of that syndrome is that if you do not form an emotional connection, your level of emotional uh, volatility can be very, very high. And it's not just through crappy parents. It can be through one person I met years ago um, belonged to a family where they had adopted like 16 children, which is a delightful and a wonderful thing to do. But there was a lot of dysfunction because a lot of them were coming from trauma. And then they couldn't give that many people enough emotional attention for them to have very, very secure bonds. So that can happen as well. Illness can lead to it. The death of another family member, the need to caretake an elderly parent can mean that people have children that they cannot then focus upon. And it is not that we need the sole focus. In fact, that can be really bad for people. It can give them an inflated sense of self, which is like kind of what might have happened with the you're here to repopulate the world after we talk about how many veterans died, how many soldiers died in World War II, and how many people perished in the Holocaust. It was 6 million Jews and 5 million other people, so 11 million people in those camps. Um, and then, but the civilian death in Europe was astounding. It was, it's just staggering how many millions of people died. And so they were a rebuilding generation. So there was a lot of focus on them because it's like, oh, we've lost so much. So we focus a lot. When we have lost issues, we have a tendency to focus on what we have a little bit too much. And we all have our stuff to sort through. And it's not condemning any particular generation. It really is just recognizing societal influences go into your nurturing and your nature experience. So your nature and your nurture. Nurture can really, really cause a lot of dysfunction Healing can bring you back to your natural setting. And it's why so many incredibly good people are like, I have these behaviors in the past that I don't even understand. It's like, well, it's because it's a known repercussion of some emotional damage that was sometimes intentionally inflicted upon you, sometimes not so. And it is one of the ways that we release self-blame because we try to forgive other people often before we forgive ourselves. And self-forgiveness is one of the biggest things that we need to achieve within healing. And other people may not extend forgiveness towards us, but like if you're living your life trying to make amends, then you're living in that energy of like, I realize that I have had these things happen, that I participated in these difficult situations. I understand now that it was a result rather than something having to do with a character flaw. And that is the worth of understanding these things from a scientific level.
we've belabored that enough. Let's talk a little bit about how spirituality is one of the things that can connect people to their ability to heal themselves. Because not everybody realistically has access to a therapist. Not everybody realistically can do something like book somebody like me. And I, I specialize in a form of tarot that not a lot of other people do, but that doesn't mean I'm a unicorn. Other people do it as well. Not everybody has the means. And then the other thing in is if you were devalued by having an emotionally orphaning experience, you may have trouble spending money on your well-being. And I find this over and over again, particularly in female trauma survivors, is they will spend money on their appearance, but they will not spend money on their wellness. Because in their heart of hearts, they have kind of ingested the idea that if I was treated as being worthless by the very people who were supposed to love me, I can't be a very worthwhile or worthy person. I'm not very valuable. If you were treated as having no value within a household, and I obviously was, but I am so far from alone, um, it can convince you that you are a person without value rather than you are a person with understandable trauma and damage that if you do the work, you can understand. And I got super, super lucky. And this is one of the areas where I'm going to talk about something really whimsical and fantastic. But if you need an example of there being some form of spiritual and energetic influence in this world that we cannot understand, there are two periods in history that you can easily call to mind that will like help you understand. No, people can be under the influence of something that is not particularly 3D. It overrides their reason. It overrides their character. Um, one is World War II in Nazi Germany. How in the world does people ever convince themselves to burn people in ovens and turn a blind eye to it? I'll never, ever know. And then most recently, we've had issues within the United States in which uh, power structures trying to cling to power, try to make us tear each other apart. And people very obviously believe things that are like, there are space lasers? What's what, Guys, are you okay? Um, but they really, really, really believe that. And there is a spiritual influence behind that. They're not just crazy people. And I know that I do something that somebody could look at and like, dude, you have a lot of room to talk. Don't you talk to pieces of paper and find people's future in that? And just, yeah, of course I do. Spiritual influences are real. There is a world unseen. And what that specifically contains, nobody really knows. But that it's real is true. Um, because there's no way in the world I could do any of the things that I can do when I am very, very rarely in the same room with or even looking at the person that I'm reading. There is something beyond this. And th what it is, I don't know. But I know that there are stories that occur over and over in time trying to help us understand the idea of rebirth, which is about leaving a past version of ourselves behind. If you uh, listen to somebody like Dan McClellan, who is a uh, Bible scholar who's very, very scholastically inclined, um, one of the things that emerges is that the idea that, you know, Christ was the Son of God was like an implementation of a particular period. At first, Christ was just a big old rebel, which please remember that. If you're like, if you've encountered the Christian religion and you're judging it by, it's like, go with Gandhi's thing, even though Gandhi's a really problematic person too, which is, I like your Christ, I don't like your Christians. There's a lot of hypocrisy in the way that Christianity is practiced because they're not really practicing the teachings of Christ. They're saying, I'm saved, I'm forgiven. You're not really forgiven unless you're really dwelling in that energy. And it's not about forgiveness from on high. It is that you have not uh, shed your darker side. You are no longer controlled by it. If somebody is motivated by hate or, or greed or judgment of others, they, they are not living in their highest energy. But Christ was originally a rebel. Christ was someone who challenged authority. Christ was somebody who did not conform. And if you look at the prophets from most major religions that were not clearly working with an agenda, and I'm not going to go into the, the you know, L. Ron Hubbard, the clearly working from an agenda, uh, people who are trying to make, but they all have these similarities in the stories. Most of the people who the uh, religions are formed around, they rebelled against the known at that particular time, usually calling out corruption. And that is one of the things that Christ did. And when we talk about people being saved by Christ, what they really are saved by are, are the teachings of Christ that teach you how to be a good person, to leave your shadow side behind, to step into your highest light. And that is one of the things that will help people evolve. And so that's one of the things that goes on with Christianity and how it is actually used to control people and make them feel superior, which allows them to look down on other people instead of actually following the real teachings. Uh, the spiritual leader who that person was um, actually existed, but there has been, again, please look to Bible scholars, this is not me. 
This is, please remember, every religious tome is a translation of a translation of a translation of a translation. And uh, just play the game of telephone to find out what happens over the course of time. It can be molded into what people want it to be. And that is a little bit what happens. But the basic teachings of Buddhism, of Hinduism in some instances, of Christianity, of a lot, there are so many different belief systems in this world. They have things that are connective tissue about how if we treat each other kindly, if we treat um, those around us with love, if we do not judge, if we accept, we will form better societies and we will have better outcomes. Personal spirituality, where you're not looking at the how are other people behaving, but rather what am I looking for inside of myself? I'm looking for a way away from the dysfunction, the pain, the disorder that was caused by trauma and damage. And take it into the 3D and be pretty literal when you start thinking about it. If you took a developing person and you bang them all over with a baseball bat and broke a lot of their bones, you would expect them to limp, to have pain, to have a uh, disorder, to not be able to use their limbs and function in a way because they had been badly, badly injured. So why do we treat our emotional body so differently? Because it's not seen. And only until recently was it understood. It's now understood a great deal more. And that's why so many people are in the curse-breaking generation where your understanding, hi, your understanding can take you from dysfunction into order, into healing, into evolution. And one of the things that happened to me is that I did not have an emotional connection to a human being. So I connected to stories and I was very drawn to stories of goodness. And I was very, I loved Quicker Farm Camp. And I've told the story about how like, oh, wow. So now I know that was basically a magic summoning. And then we need to get into the idea of what fairies are. This is where it gets a little bit whimsical, but it's just an example. Um, what are fairies? Oh, something unseen with an influence and we don't truly understand them. But if you think about Grimm's fairy tales, then you know that they are not all sunny and light and, you know, like cutesy things. So they're not Tinkerbell. Uh, they could be understood as vampiric energies. They could be understood as delusional ones, as compulsive ones. Um, that there are these elemental energies that attach to the different elements within us. And so they are basically elemental spirits. And one of the things that exists in lore that is told over and over again are that they have a very special relationship to wanting to take babies. Purely innocent. They're very attracted to innocent souls. And what happened to me was when I was seven years old, I was in the woods around an invocation fire where people sat and tried to connect to a spiritual source. And apparently I connected to something that became very, very protective of me. And I've always related to it as the Archangel Gabriel, but it's not like we've like ever sat down and had dinner and like, tell me what it's like to be the Archangel Gabriel. I don't know what it is. It's the spirit of, it's the chief communication energy. It is the element of air. It is one of the reasons that I can do all of this without any script preparation. I never know what I'm going to say until I sit down and I say it. Whatever I'm connected to is trying to help people heal. And it helped me heal first. And it is some form of teacher and it is some form of guardian. And I know that it follows the rules of right and wrong as I understand them to be about uh, kindness and compassion absolutely down the line. Like it, it always leads back to there. So whatever it is, it has good intent and it has always protected me tremendously. And um, so I formed that connection and then I'm going to tell you the story of why a spiritual connection can be the thing that brings you the changes in your life that you need to. So I alluded very briefly to the story of my father dying, which was like, I mean, he had been sick for, he sickened very quickly. Um, he was in the hospital for a week with, uh, uh, he'd had another heart attack. Um, he was in the hospital for a week. That was when I was going back and forth. And they released him because he technically did not have medical insurance. So I think he got the Veterans Administration to uh, pay for it somehow. I'm not positive. I just know that there were no hospital bills afterwards. Um, they release him. He goes home that very night and he has another catastrophic uh, heart failure. And I was the person that had to call the ambulance and there's blood everywhere because he's coughing up blood because he has bilateral pneumonia and his heart's failing. And I did not realize how much peril I was actually in of being put into foster care on the day that he died. I was completely alone. My mother lived in another state. She technically didn't even know what was going on because I knew better than to try and involve her in anything because she... Uh, I understood at a level that my mother was a narcissist before I had the technical terms for it. So he's in the hospital that last day and he very dramatically dies and I'm there by myself and everybody's kind of freaked out. But um, before he dies uh, and it's clear that he's dying, 
they're telling me, do you have anybody here? Please call them. Because I'm a 15-year-old kid by myself, and the nurses are fully freaked out about what, and I didn't get that they were freaked out because this man is dying, and we have to send that girl to foster care. And just taking one look at her, she's not going to be okay. Because I was almost impossible to tell what to do. And then, you know, there's just, there's a lot of, you can get really lucky in foster care. You can. There are wonderful foster parents. There also, there's a lot of peril for things like abuse and sexual assault. And they were freaked all the way out. They did not want me to go into foster care, but they did not tell me that. Instead, they're like, anybody, who, who do you have an aunt? Do you have, I'm like, no, I don't have anybody. Um, so I called my best friend. Um, I had met her when I was 10 and her parents, uh, my father died uh, very quickly and I left the hospital and my best friend came with me. And we were in the graveyard together. And by the time I got back from the graveyard, because the graveyard was across the street from the hospital, um, my family doctor was there. My father's uh, general practitioner was there. The Episcopal priest uh, that was the head of uh, St. Stephen's, which is where I went to Episcopal Church. It was a very liberal faction. And then my friend's parents were also there. And I did not understand that like a community had come out of the woods to be like, Oh, she's in trouble. <laughs> she's in trouble. He's dead. And they're going to put her in foster care. And like, she'll probably kill somebody to get out of it because it was impossible to tell me what to do. I had been put in charge of way too much since the time I was 12. And so I had to function like an adult, but I wasn't one. So a village surrounds me and saves me. And in that time, I they tell me to call my mother. <laughs> I'm laughing because it's not funny. It's not funny. They tell me to call my mother, but I laugh because it's a trauma response. I call my mother and she begins to berate me and scream at me and tell me that I'm stupid and what am I talking about? And so my father, having just died right in front of me, I was like, well, I don't need this. And I hung up the phone and just walked away. <laughs> And she had no idea how to find me. She had no idea how to find me. She was left understanding only that Debbie, my friend Debbie's parents were there with me and she knew Debbie's last name. And it was Moran, which is a very, 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 very common name within the area that I was in. And that woman got stuck calling every Moran that she could find in uh, out of state uh, phone book. Um, and I still laugh about that because it's like, well, that served you, right? Um, it, it genuinely, I have no shame around that. It was like, I cannot even believe that she decided to start abusing me um, as I'm just standing there in shell shock. And I was enough of a rebel at that age that I was like, oh, screw you. <laughs> Gone. Um, but she did have power over me and she made me go and live with her in another state. And uh, that turned about out as well as it, you might think it would. Um I was a chronic disappointment to her because I looked like her but wouldn't act like her at all. But that is what happened that whenever I really needed support, it always showed up and it always has. It always has. I had a long and difficult period overcoming a lot of that anger, which I now understand was a symptom of abuse versus a character flaw and that everything that I've come back to is actually my basic character. Um... Whenever I've needed it, it's shown up because I formed that connection so early on. And I didn't question it. I didn't realize that everybody else didn't do that. It's like, you don't know that there's something there, really? Like, okay. Um, and that's really different for me because there's so much evidence of it in my life. Either I get lucky break after lucky break after lucky break, and I really was just blessed by a fairy in those woods. Or there's something that looks out for me, and I just, something looks out for me. And if it's just my highest self, it's just my highest self, but it's good at what it does. And that's what spirituality can do for you, is it helps you form a connection to your best outcomes. And I talk to my clients a lot about the need to meditate. And I will be doing an episode on meditation and how there is some like evidence that long meditation. So I tell people, oh, you only have to do it for like 10 minutes to allow yourself, your mind to clear, to create that space so your own intuition can kick in with the knowledge, that inform information, the informative aspect of intuition. Um, you only need to do it for about 10 minutes because I will go into this in a different episode. But they're showing that meditation in the long term can exacerbate depression and anxiety. Smaller doses are good. Larger doses can exacerbate rather than alleviate the problems. But it is an important part of finding the still and the quiet part of you to create that space, to create the emptiness where you are. And if you have to do a training wheel meditation, or if you have to do the old, you know, smell the flowers, blow out the candles, smell the flowers, blow out the candles, uh, to try and keep yourself calm, that does it too. And it does not have to last long, but it 
gives you access to your spiritual battery. And when you are connected to that, you are led to the answers that you need. What I'm always trying to convey to people in the collective of the Patreon and people who come to me for readings is something led you to these answers. You were looking for it, but something led you to it. I will, I've done entire pick of cards on YouTube, and it turns out that it's just got this very key message from one person. We are guided towards our answers when we reach for them. When we want to heal, if we are willing to do so, understanding that there's nothing of this that I need to shy away from. I need to take a look at it. And you can have compassion for people. Like, I have compassion for my mother. I look at her screwed up story, and th there's no way she was going to be okay either. I look at my father, and I'm just like, okay, technically I know that my grandmother had him because she was trying to secure a relationship with a man who was very, very difficult and likely a perpetrator of a cycle of abuse, who died very, very suddenly, and then she slipped into alcoholic melancholy for the rest of her life. And she could be very, very unkind to me. I'm not kind of letting her off the hook entirely. She was mean to a little kid on a regular basis, but I don't necessarily blame her. She got a kid dumped on her and she was not a maternal person in the first place. She was just fixated on her husband. And then he died. And um, she was left in misery for the rest of her life until she managed to smoke and drink herself to actual death. And it's a sad and a traumatic story. But when I look at her, I also know that the information and understanding that is available to me was not available to her. And that's what forgiveness really is. It's not saying, I see you as a being of light and I have compassion for you and everything that, like, it doesn't matter what you did, you're just a suffering soul. That is one form of forgiveness. But the truly resonant get you out of a karmic cycle one is, I do not flinch away from what you really did. I really do face it. I understand even what it did to me and I still forgive you. And that is real forgiveness. We cannot heal what we won't look at. When we talk about the past and how we are an unreliable narrator in our life, we remember the things that are trying to bring us the lessons that we need. And sometimes we're in a false construct. Sometimes people get stuck in a victim stage, which is how the idea of recognizing how you were victimized became so shameful, is some people get stuck in the why me stage for the rest of their lives. And that's usually something that causes something called borderline personality disorder. Um, where they're just very confused by their pain. But all of these things can be resolved or at least made more functional through a greater understanding of self and the ability to seek out the information that we need. And it's never about judgment. It's about understanding. And when it comes to recognizing, because nobody, like most of the trauma survivors that I've met, they feel very ashamed of what happened to them because they are convinced that, well, it had to be my fault on some level. It had to be. Like, they don't realize that they've actually just absorbed that idea at a core and a cellular level. If you are willing to look at what was done to you with that would be so damaging from the perspective of step outside yourself. And again, what did I talk about? If I was watching a movie of this happening to a kid, a mini series, I like by about episode three, I'd be like, somebody needs to send those people to another planet and get that kid out of there. Um, and I realized that if I would have that much compassion for a, like a person I was seeing from a distance, I would need to have it for myself. But then I began to understand that I needed to have compassion for people acting out that badly, um, that showing that much unhappiness and misery were actually victims of things that they could not heal. And that is what carries things forward. And it's why getting stuck in the victim stage will make you nothing but miserable. But recognizing the ways in which you may have been victimized and being able to process the grief, the pain, the anger sometimes around it is the thing that will actually free you. And then you get to release the past version of yourself. Because the past is memory, but it contains the building blocks of who we became that leaves us with our shadow side. And frequently, so many people don't like to look at their shadow side because they're ashamed of it. They're like, that's not who I really am. It really isn't. It's a wound. Heal it and you become who you really are. And heal it and become who you really are. And then, then you really forgive. But if you're still having episodes of depression and anxiety, if you're still having issues where you get disproportionately angry because more emotion will come to the table in a set of circumstances when you are you have unprocessed emotions. That's why you can't get away with like, I just let it go without processing it and without feeling it. 
You can't get away with that and actually be really healed, unless it's very light trauma. So there is a proviso with that. If you basically had a really good life and you're like, well, my father worked out just that little bit too much, but like, and he was very gendered or whatever it might be. That's like light trauma that may not have damaged your entire life. But I, de I deal with deep trauma survivors and people who have complex post-traumatic stress disorder and aren't fully understood even within the uh, psychiatric community because it's a developing field. And we really needed people who had suffered through it to explain this is what it feels like, this is what happens. And this is how I've addressed it. And that's a little bit what I do is I went through a whole bunch of things and uh, my ability to take things apart at the seams and understand them gave me some information that it applies to other people and I'm able to convey those lessons to other people. And this field is continuing to develop and I anticipate within the next 20 years or so it being so very commonplace that we will have applied the actual remedy instead of finding the band-aid and the healing ointment, which is what we're doing right now. Emotional orphaning creates a deficit within when it comes to worth and it creates codependency. Um, emotional abandonment, which can happen when you know otherwise secure family life splits apart and pulls the rug out from underneath somebody. Abandonment issues can happen, but they're not the same thing as emotional abandonment. Um, emotional orphaning. Abandonment creates a dysfunctional pattern within relationships. Emotional orphaning creates something where you will struggle with your attachment to yourself and to other people. And until such time as you examine what went into that and, oh, what do you mean I'm just a natural result proven through theory and study of the things that happened to me? Do you mean the things that I don't like about myself are just a natural known result? And when you do that, you understand it's not your fault. And that's the key to the prism of trauma, is understanding that really everything that you've struggled with is a symptom. And that if you choose to become the best version of yourself, you can free yourself entirely from all that pain, all that darkness, all that confusion. That's where spirituality comes in. And I'm not talking, I'm always saying, like, please, you know, religion is a very corrupt structure. Frankly, there's some things in the spiritual world where um, your answers are going to be yours. They're not going to fit absolutely to a T somebody else's. You will discover things that are uh, in your practice of being able to connect with yourself that are unique and individual to you because you are an individual soul. And we always have to revisit one of, I will quote things that, like, are just so true that it doesn't mean that everything else that was said by an individual is true. Um, but C.S. Lewis is, you do not have a soul. You are a soul. You have a body. And it is so important to remember that because your soul is what guides you out of your trauma and your darkness, your pain and your confusion. But your trauma is contained within your emotional body because what causes emotions, it's things firing within your brain. So it's your body damage to your emotional body and to your emotional response system, which is controlled by brain chemistry and impulses, is part of your body. And that is why I'm always bringing up, you have a soul, you don't have a soul, you are a soul, you have a body. Your body sustained damage from the treatment you received. And your soul, which cannot be corrupted unless you allow it to be. Your soul is the thing that can lead you away from that because it is the part of you that is connected to a collective. And whenever we're trying to figure out what collectives really mean, all we have to do is look at political landscapes where groups of people believe the same thing to the exclusion of like, it's all they can believe. You can't talk to them. They are in complete denial. They're locked into an energy. And the more and more people that they have in that collective, the more and more impenetrable the mental and energetic fortress can become. Being open-minded is one of the things that can also free you. Don't put yourself in energetic prisons. And that includes spirituality. It includes the idea of things like light workers and star seeds and indigo children. And that is a narrative to help us explain something that we don't fully understand. I've said that before. I will likely say it again. But it's not the only thing that is true because the truth is very vast indeed. But the part of you that understands it at a level where it doesn't need 
all of that information. The information opens the door, the soul walks through and does the cleaning and does the healing and does the everything else and leads you towards the path that will bring you the happiness, the abundance, the connection. It is the thing that rescues you from being orphaned because when people talk to me about, I just want my person, it's like, well, you are your person. You may be in love at different points. You may have a, a different romantic person. You may have a soulmate. But the person who will rescue you, the person that will heal you, the person that will sustain you, the person that will never leave your side, the person that you can rely on in any set of circumstances is actually you. And if you didn't learn that, it's not your fault and it's not too late to do it. Even if you are in your 80s and going, this describes me, there's still worth in doing this work because even if you only have six years to live, they can be happy years, they can be healthy years, they can be connected years. They can, and there is almost nothing more healing to understanding. There's more going on than we can see. And is there a world beyond this? Yeah, there is. I do spirit guide readings and I do spirit readings and spirit mediumship. And I was not a willing spirit medium. And like I've told that story before, I won't go into it here. And it's accurate information. I have no way of knowing it. There's something unseen. And once we prove that there is something unseen, it becomes limitless in the possibilities of what is possible. Connect to that part of yourself and you can overcome the physical damage to your physical house. You have a body, your brain was damaged through too much trauma because tra tra trauma, sustained trauma, damages the brain. And abandonment, emotional abandonment or emotional orphaning is one of the things that can be traumatizing because we all need to be soothed and we all need to be comforted. And it's one of the reasons that self-soothing and self-comforting is one of the things that you will learn in therapy or learn through your own process. All this information is now available. Please try for reputable sources. Whenever I'm quoting things, I always like to do a fact check on, is this place you know based on peer-reviewed science? Because understanding neuroscience, they're not separate worlds. Spirituality and science are meant to coexist. It's not supposed to be all science or all spirituality. It's not. That's the logic and the emotion. And we are meant to have the heart-mind confluence. And when we have the heart-mind confluence, which your heart is part of your immortal soul, then you will understand the logic that, of what was done to you causing the damage that held you back. And once you understand that, you can free yourself from it and you can step into a joy-filled existence that is not available to you when it's based in denial. And unfortunately, faux forgiveness where you either take on the blame for things that happen to you. Um, I understand it because like I must have been really hard for that sick person. They still had an obligation to take good care of you. We shouldn't have children we don't want to care for. I'm a living example of, I'm so lucky. I'm so lucky because that exact set of circumstances that I am describing has resulted in people like Ted Bundy. I am so fortunate that I formed a significant connection to uh, basically spirituality, although I didn't realize it was that, at such a young age because it saved me from feeling entirely alone. And feeling entirely alone, the idea of being emotionally abandoned and emotionally orphaned can lead to antisocial behaviors. It can also lead to conduct disorders. Some things can't be cured, but a lot of things can. And the easiest path towards healing is to begin with information that leads to understanding, that leads to building of a system that will work for you. What has been disordered can be brought into order. What has been dysfunctional can be brought into function. And one of the things to understand is if you are emotionally orphaned, which can encompass the idea of, oh, I have abandonment issues, it's just at a slightly lesser degree than emotionally orphaning, is your spiritual connection, being able to find that refuge within, because there is nothing that can calm you down like your own mind. There is nothing that can sustain you and encourage you like your own thought process. There is nothing that can give you the strength and the power and the will to keep going on to manifest the life that you want other than what is inside of you. If you look to an external source, other people have all their own crap. You have to be able to be self-reliant and independent and that is not the same thing as being alone. But when you are self-reliant and you are independent and you are finding that world within, nothing knocks you off balance any longer 
for very long because you know how to sustain and right your ship. When everything, anything causes some, you know, waves in your personal ocean, you are the person who is able to be like, this is going on with me. I, this is self-care I need to undertake. It's worse for me than it might be for somebody else because it's tapping into this really old and deep damage. It's beautiful to have people around us who support us. It's beautiful to have love around us. But the greatest source of healing comes from connecting to yourself without judgment, without shame, by understanding no matter who you are, something went into making you. Even if you're somebody who suffers from, and this is not something I particularly suffer from at a level that I've seen it happen with other people, resenting other people, being jealous of them. It, you, you have a, a feeling that you were left out on some level. And our society particularly uh, it, it encourages us to it, you know, kind of compare ourselves to others. And that can cause jealousy. And we can get caught in those negative thought patterns. What we're talking about is breaking cycles, which is the same thing as breaking generational trauma, which is the same thing as breaking generational curses. You live in the information age that also gives you access to spirituality. You have the heart-mind confluence available to you at all times. Utilize the tools and you can build the palace that you wish to reside in, okay? Even if you've been emotionally orphaned, even if you have deep-seated trauma issues, even if you made all kinds of mistakes in your past, understanding your mistakes will give you the ability to release shame and guilt and blame, which is the biggest thing that holds us back from self-love. And the thing that holds us back from a spiritual connection to our higher self is a lack of ability to believe that there is something pure and good within me that is my immortal soul. And that's a very loaded term because of religion, but please just like sweep that off the table. There is something within you that gives you your perspective and it is unique and there is only one you. People may fall into patterns, but only you know what's going on inside of your mind. You can go to somebody like me and I can tell you a lot of things, but there's stuff that you know that I will never know. You are your best form of insight and you may need guides and you may need teachers and you may need tools, but you live in a time and a place when those are available to you. In order for orphans always dream of being adopted. And what we're talking about is learning how to adopt yourself and become the leader and the guide and even the parent that you didn't have. And you have that all at your fingertips. You just have to take the steps towards it. And will it be easy? No, it's not easy. And the deeper your damage, the harder it can be. But then it gets easier, and then it gets easier, and then it gets easier. And you feel better, and you feel better, and you feel better. And you need fewer and things around you because you have that source within. There is a cure to being emotionally orphaned. And it's within you. And you just have to find that connection and then find that information and have patience with yourself. You deserve it. You deserve to be healed from the damage you did not do to yourself. Please stop blaming yourself and find the ways to heal yourself. This has been Logical Magic Examining Esoterica. You need to find me. It's at therisingmoon.com or Chromecast at the Rising Moon. I have a Patreon where we talk a lot about these things as well. You're also welcome there. But thank you for joining this, and I hope that you found it helpful. Take care and be well.